Hey there, I'll try and keep this short. So the Pile of Shame campaign ended last week, and for those who don't know, that was my DCC actual play series where the goal was for me to chew through some of my backlog I had accrued over time. You guys can now get in podcast form on Spotify and a bunch of other places. I'll post the link below. Anyway, I thought I would do a video reviewing all six modules that we ended up playing through. These reviews will be a bit lighter in detail, and some of these ones definitely deserve their own videos that I will probably do at a later date. I also don't have a script for this, so you'll get to experience my more rambly, unfocused discussion that my smooth chicken breast brain defaults to. And obviously, spoilers for all scenarios covered in the video. Anyway, let's get to it. All right, so the first one we're starting off with is Hole in the Sky, which is the funnel we did in the first session. I don't like to waste anybody's time, so let's just answer the question that you guys all have, which is, is Hole in the Sky better than Sailors? And the answer is, it depends. It really is going to change the tone of whatever campaign you're doing. If you're doing this for a campaign, if you're doing it uh, just by itself, both of them are really good. Uh, you can't go wrong with either of these. I think your group will have a blast. But if you're doing campaign, this is where you set the tone for your campaign. And Sailors has a much more Warhammer fantasy roleplay kind of feel to it. Honestly, you could probably run Morkborg with it. You know, you got the Beastmen, you got Chaos, you got this old keep with miasma and just undead and weird things. And in case anybody's worried about spoilers, I'm not gonna say anything more than that. That's all basically stuff that you'll learn in the opening monologue of Sailors, so I didn't really ruin anything for you there if you're gonna play it you're gonna learn that pretty soon anyway but that's much more the tone it's a much more classic down-to-earth kind of sword and sorcery adventure hole in the sky you have to go to a different world which in its entirety is a prison world and so from level zero your players are going off to a different dimension so obviously you can see how that would be a very very different tone starter than sailors is if you want the more gonzo dcc campaign go with that go with hole in the sky um, but if you want more grounds around sorcery one to start off with, just get, you know, let them find their footing a little bit first, then go sailors. Both are solid. So a lot of these aren't going to be like super in-depth reviews. I'm really just going to do sort of, I don't want to say surface level because that sounds like I'm not really going to be telling you anything, but I'm hoping to at least, you know, parse some information. Also talk a little bit about the campaign here and there, though I'll just say right now, you don't need to watch the campaign to watch this video. I'm, it, it's just going to be maybe some minor spoilers here and there, but mostly you'll be fine. I'm going to say go to a different dimension, which happens to be a prison, and you have this giant creature, you have this sort of jack-o'-lantern horror that's terrorizing the players. There's a lot of fun stuff here that I really think a lot of players aren't going to expect to get from a session like one. A lot of players don't get first games where you go to a different dimension and have to deal with a bunch of weirdness. A lot of people really do start their campaigns going like, well, first you gotta kill goblins and undead, and then you can go do the cool stuff. And I like that they sort of skip this and go, no, no, you're doing the cool stuff now. A lot of you are gonna die, but the ones who survive are gonna have a good time. It's a very straightforward funnel past that. It's got some really fun stuff, but overall, this one isn't reinventing the wheel when it comes to funnels. It's, you know, you got a place, you go through it, you go through it, a lot of dudes die, and then you get to the end of it and that's it. There's no real surprises past that. But I will say there are some really fun events in this that I love. One of the ones, weirdly, that I don't know people would guess I like a lot is the Sea Shrikes at the beginning, which basically, at the beginning of that funnel, the players are walking across an invisible bridge across the ocean. And at a certain point, they go past a wreck that has all these disgusting, like, tumor birds that come and fly at them. Now, the encounter itself is pretty classic, you know, basically have just savage wild animals. What I like is the detail they added, which I don't think enough modules add, which is when these sea shrikes, these big fucking tumor birds, get three corpses dragged off as food, they leave the party alone. I just find there's way too many, especially like in funnels and early level DCC stuff, and just in general uh, in OSR games as well. There's a level of like, oh yeah, they attack. And I know there's morale rules and other things that people have, but I do find funnels are a lot of time for newer people who might not know. Like it's a good entry into the system. And I think those little details do add a lot. I think a lot of people go like, oh, that's actually cool. Like I actually should do that. Like, that's, that's a good way. Because you look at it and it's seven sea shrikes, which honestly, I think I, if I remember correctly, it's been, we started, we played in November. So it's, <laughs> you'll have to forgive me for not remembering all the details. I do believe they, they fucked up the sea shrikes pretty good. But seven sea shrikes, honestly, could easily mess up most of the party in the basically the first encounter before they even get to the uh, the portal. So I could see some newer newer people going like, oh, what the hell? How am I how am I supposed to use this? Like this is this seems like way too much, way too much damage. Even though they only do a D three damage and their bites only like plus one, you know you got seven of those, and I mean, you can easily have about seven level zeros with uh, eight or nine AC and like one or two hit points. Like it's easy to like, you could just get kill after kill after kill and I can see that happening. But yeah, I like that I like that for like maybe perhaps a newer GM. They see that and go, okay, great. So they just get, they just need to get three and then they're gone and the encounter's over. I don't need to worry about them just murdering most of the party like relentlessly. 
because they're hungry birds. They don't, they, they're not out there just to murder the players. They're living creatures that just want some food and they haven't had some in a while. I think the prison itself, firstly, is really cool. I'll put some of the art on screen as, as we talk about certain things. Firstly, I love the art of the prison. It's got like this whole like weird spiky kind of structure look, which I think is just fun. You really do make it feel more alien by doing those sort of things. One thing I like too is that I like the general atmosphere uh, that you get when it comes to the prison itself because you have this big giant. Now, what's funny is the players don't really know that the giant is honestly not ever a problem. He's in this deep slumber that is very hard to wake him up from. So he might get up and like crush one if that comes to it, but even then it probably won't even happen. And then just go back to sleep. Like it, it, you are on edge about him, which I like a lot. I, li I like having the idea of like, oh, there's something right here to lurk in the whole time. Cause when you play it, the players were always on edge. Cause which, and I think that was more effective than just, oh, we're going through rooms and there's probably a skeleton on their side, or there's certain things that are here or there. Like, you just know when you're going through, like, there might be things around the corner that could hurt us. When you know what it is, but you don't know how you're going to deal with it, or when it might wake up. It's a bit like that Alfred Hitchcock, like, the bomb under the table kind of thing. It's like, you see the bomb there, you don't know when it might go off. I think it's a great setup for going through to keep the players on edge. And the other thing I like, of course, is Kur Maxima, which is the giant jack-o'-lantern horror that just fucks with the players uh he was really fun to play i did enjoy uh the part where john one of his characters looked out a hole and just looked into ker maxima's eye and just fucking dragged him out i think that was really fun and i'll show you the artwork for this guy uh because he looks awesome honestly i think that should be a creature that would be really fun to reuse in other things i don't know if i would necessarily the same people because they would recognize it but I feel like this is a very fun character concept, especially if you're doing like a Halloween game. Uh, you could absolutely retheme that for a Halloween thing as the monster. And also, he's he's real, real nasty for level zeros. He's really, again, like the Sea Shrikes, he's kind of designed to just grab one and sort of skitter off, kind of just do hit and run tactics. He keeps the pressure up and keeps the stress and like horror similar to the giant, but though a much more active and aggressive problem that the players have to deal with. And again, doesn't just go in there and murder everybody because he alone could just go in and kill 16 20 level zeros easily like he's really really tough he's got like 57 hit points uh his damage is a 2d6 plus one and he can grab um he has two uh he has two action dice he's got plus five to hit like he's got a lot he's not he's not meant to be a guy that you just throw at the party and leave him there until the end where you can you know just deal with him by opening the cage and that demon lay they let out um, goes out and rips them apart, which I just realized I haven't really explained the the premise of this one Which is usually where I should start But like I said, there's no script here. I'm just kind of rambling <laughs> so, so you're just getting a lot of my just general just stream of consciousness here But basically the group is approached by the lady in blue who is a I believe the best with like an agent of chaos is probably the best way to describe her um, and she's, I wouldn't say she misleads the group, but she omits the truth a little bit on who she is. Not that the group cares because, you know, they, they have a whole thing where the premise for them is that they've sort of felt like they have adventure that they need to go find that they've been sort of, uh, led away from by their mundane lives. So I think no matter who she was, uh, the, the way the characters feel about it is that they would take the job anyway. But basically, uh, sh they are hired by this lady in blue to go uh, free um, a person from a cage. Um, and when they do that, obviously that turns out to be actually more of a demon lady. It's a fun scene where she's sort of in this cage, the top of the prison. She has these like bat wings, but the way she has them folded over her makes it look like a cloak. So when the players are trying to get her out, they don't notice that she looks like a horrifying sort of demon creature. They look like, oh, it's just this poor woman in a cage. And then when you let her out, she just jumps out and immediately goes for her jailer, Kerr Maxima, the big fucking, big, big jack-o'-lantern guy, because he's been terrorizing her the entire time. She's been waiting for this moment to just get rid of him. And once he's destroyed, the portal opens up. And as we saw in the game, everybody just jumped down, just fucking skydived into the portal opening um, and got to leave. And after that, you have this fun little part that I think really ended up making some stuff very funny which was the wheel of destiny which ended up i think having some players who had died be back alive again and some of the players who had lived now be dead i even think there was one character who got like that role where basically <laughs> that character just wakes up tomorrow filled with a sense of longing and just completely forgetting the adventure they went on and go back to their mundane life and for the rest of their life, they just feel like they missed out on a big opportunity. Which I gotta say, 
depending on how much that affects you as a person, that might be worse than the death roll <laughs> where you just die. You live the rest of your life just having this longing that you can never ever get. I, like I said, I don't want to go too in depth on these because we have six to cover and so it's a lot for me to go too deeply into them. But I think this was a great one. I thought it was a great way to start off the campaign. I did partially pick it because of how gonzo it was. I want for both the audience and the players to see, hey guys, we are starting off with a bang. We aren't just doing a classic, oh, you're a bunch of peasants, go through some dungeons. Uh, get murdered and do stuff. I want to be like, no, no, we're going to be doing some crazy shit this campaign. So let's start off crazy and just keep getting, keep getting crazier. Which honestly it did. It's hard to believe that peasants going to an interdimensional dungeon is kind of bottom tier for where things went in this campaign. <laughs> Especially with the help of some of the people in chat um, giving bits to help things. There's a, I believe it was in, yeah, Moonslaves the Cannibal Kingdom, uh, the level two adventure. Uh, which I'll get to, but the finale there, um, <laughs> the explosive finale, was not one I was expecting, which I thought was almost probably one of my favorite moments of the game. So in conclusion, um, I highly recommend this one. It was a lot of fun. It will absolutely set a gonzo tone for your campaign. So if that's what you want, I think you should go for this one. I think it works really well. I will say if you want a more grounded one, perhaps go with Sailors. But since a lot of people have already played that, you might just want to go for something like Conspiracy of Ravens. I did a video on that a while ago for like last Halloween. So it's a little bit of a rougher video, but I highly recommend that one. It's a sort of village crawl um, for a funnel and it gets, you know, real spooky. It's real dark and it's a great start to a campaign. It'll get the players on track. So like, I would recommend that if this feels like too much, but yeah, let's move on to the next one. Intrigue of the Court of Chaos. And this is an incredibly creative adventure. I'm just gonna say right now, like I said before, I don't want to waste anybody's time. If you're skipping through this to see if I uh, recommend these or not, I'm just going to say at the beginning, I recommend this one. This one's great. This is actually one of the first ones I bought. And actually, part of the reason why I did the campaign in the first place was because I wanted to run this. Because I had put off so many times running this for my friends or for other campaigns. Because I just, for some reason, found it daunting. And it is, if you read it, there is a lot of stuff you're like, oh man, this is this has a lot more to it than most DCC adventures do. There's a lot more intrigue and RP, and I was still finding my footing with the actual play itself, so I was like, not totally sure, but I'm glad I did it because this was so much fun. Okay, so one thing I want to say about this, uh, this module, is that I ran differently for this actual play than I probably would have if I was running this as part of a, a, a more sandboxy campaign, a more expansive open campaign that didn't really have much of a limit. Because with this, I was trying to, I was trying to limit alienating people who were coming in. I want every sort of scenario to be kind of self-capsulated that like anybody joining the Twitch stream could just be like, oh, this is what's going on. Cool. I'm into it. Not like, oh, this is episode six. I have no clue what the hell is happening. I kind of wanted to make sure anybody could just join and have fun with that. And also I kind of want to evoke sort of those pulp stories where you just have, you know, these self-encapsulated adventures that are like really crazy and just all together in one thing. Just a lot of good content in just a short period of time is what I was kind of going for. What I'm leading to is that thing with Intrigue of the Core of Chaos, I really think it's best to take your time with this. Um, not like, I don't mean like take like 17 sessions to do. The dungeon crawl itself, which we'll get to in a second, is pretty quick, but the host of chaos is fantastic. I think if you're doing a campaign with DCC, I think the host of chaos is a perfect group, uh, faction, whatever you want to call it, for both a source of conflict, source of patrons, quests, content, whatever. I think there's so much because you have you have both the infighting of the, of the Chaos Lords, you have a bunch of different people at the Court of Chaos for people that you could talk to for intrigue and other things. You have lawful entities and neutral entities there as well as well as other places. So you can keep them, even if they're not at the Court of Chaos, just having those Chaos Lords come back as recurring characters or as forces sort of, you know, pushing the chess pieces around. I think they're really good for that. And I feel like I was rushing us through it a little bit because I kind of have to keep the pacing up, but I think you could take your time there. I, I, I could see you having most, if not all, of a session just spent at the core of chaos, just dealing with intrigue and other things, maybe a little bit of side things here and there. I think you could absolutely do that and your players would have a great time. As for the dungeon crawl itself, really, really fun. It's mostly puzzles. So already as level zeros, they've gone off to, you know, this interdimensional prison. And now as level ones, they're in these, this, these weird courts of chaos and they're being sent off to a plane of law. So already at level one, we had just a bunch of plane hopping, which is not a thing I usually have in a lot of my games. A lot of my games are much more grounded, much more darker fantasy or less gonzo crazy stuff that DCC offers a lot of time. That's why I wanted to, you know, try some different stuff here. And 
the thing about it is that most of this dungeon is puzzles and i and i find those very interesting because those are firstly very hard to do most of the times when i see them in games i, I actually tend to skip them um no i, no, I should say most of the time but i do tend to skip a good amount every once in a while where i go if i'm having trouble even understanding what this puzzle's supposed to be when i'm reading it and reading the answer my players are going to have an even harder time because I have to somehow parse that information to them <laughs> and also try to make sure you know, they don't get fully frustrated. And this one does it great. I will say that my players are very intelligent people and they were they got like that most of the time and there was a lot of fun stuff. I think they blasted through most of the puzzles pretty fast. In fact, I think the puzzle I thought was the easiest was the hardest one for them. And so the reason why I'm bringing the puzzles is that puzzles can be very difficult to gauge how long your game's going to be. I'm honestly surprised we were able to finish in one session. It was one of our longer sessions. I did push it maybe a little bit too far. But I do think once you get into the dungeon crawl part of it, it really isn't that big of a game. It's very dense. Um, so I think if you are doing this as part of your own campaign over a bigger thing, you can probably have a whole session just doing that part. Like I said, if you have another session, just hang out in the core chaos. But yeah, some groups with puzzles, uh, I find that, you know, you can take a lot longer of a time. Some people really aren't good puzzles. Some people don't like puzzles. That's why if you are going to run Intricate the Core Chaos, if you do have players that you're not sure about, I would definitely, definitely ask them first, are you down for a game with lots of puzzles? Because some players aren't into that. I'll be honest, um, I'm somebody who does like them sparingly, but similar to weird, annoying traps... I'm a much bigger fan of the exploration, combat, and roleplay of a lot of these games more than puzzles and traps, you know, and that sort of thing. Mostly because I find um, they can be really hard to actually uh, come across properly. In fact, this was heresy for some people who know me, but I didn't back the uh, DCC 100 because I looked at it and I was like, what is this, like four plates like spinning on top of a thing that's spinning as well, and there's this and that. I was like, this is not a thing I'm going to run, so I'm not going to back it just because it's the 100th one. I, can, I'll, I will buy it at some point, probably. I don't need to back it, though. Man, I have just been fucking rambling about the most random shit. Anyway, past my rambling, let's just look at some of these here. I think the one I liked a lot, which I did give the players a little bit, was the one where they get transported um, to a village uh, that's being attacked by a giant monster. And the only way to basically get out of it is you have to sacrifice yourself or others to the monster. And there's a few different things you could do. You could give up your, like, attributes, like give up my deeds that you can do, give up your luck, uh, give up part of, like, your personality or other things like that. You could also go more into roleplay things. You could even be like, so, give me, like, one of your favorite memories. You know, you do that sort of stuff depending on how much of a story gamer you are versus classic just mechanics and that sort of thing. But I believe one of the lower guys, they're like, you just... You kill yourself <laughs> for uh, for us, and maybe that'll be enough. And it was. And then they, when they get out of it, they would go like, "Oh wait, he's up. He's just he's sleeping. It was all just a trick." Because all the all the puzzles in here are just ones to sort of gauge how much of a lawful person you are. They're there to gauge how much you follow the tenets of law, basically. Um, and they pass the flying colors, which is funny considering how fucking chaotic the group becomes actually from the get-go they're pretty chaotic but they just continue to go down into more chaotic routes as the campaign goes along but yeah that one that one was fun i enjoyed that one so basically the one the players had the most issue with which was the enlightenment room i just found kind of boring i wasn't a fan of the puzzle itself it's not a very hard puzzle uh the players had a lot of trouble with it mostly because i think it was it's one of those puzzles that sort of gives you the answer and it's right in front of you, so you overthink what it might mean. But basically, uh, what happens is there's a hall with a bunch of lights, and then a voice speaks, and then a bunch of shadowy dancers start dancing around. When they get closer and closer to the party, they start like smashing into them and, and causing damage. And the answer to the to the puzzle is just get rid of the lights. Uh, so basically, you can either snuff out the lights, you can shoot them, like shoot the wicks with arrows, whatever it might be, uh, to just basically get the lights out. Once you do that. All the darkness basically uh, gets rid of all the shadows, and that's the that's the solution to it. Which just isn't on the same level of interesting to me as, you know, the sacrificing parts of yourself to save the town. The creation one has this primordial clay that the players, the, the solution is just to sort of form it into some sort of symbol of life. So that could be a baby, it could be like a pod plant, could be whatever happens in your world that you think fits. As long as they're going for the theme, it doesn't really matter what they do as long as they pass the check and follow the theme. It's a really creative idea. 
So this one just feels a little bit like not on the same level. But I gotta say, for a scenario that involves basically five different puzzles, all densely packed, it's pretty good. There's not a single one I dislike. I just think some are weaker than the others. But overall, I think they're all really good. Um, that's why that's why I recommend this. Because I think there's a lot of people out there who are looking for more puzzle and riddle kind of scenarios and less just pure combat, pure hack and slash through room after room. And this is perfect for that. This is basically, there is still combat, obviously. I feel like you could play this with like your mom and dad or like your family or or friends who are non-RPG players because I feel like past the Court of Chaos stuff, which might be a little bit too much for them, but you can easily streamline that. It really is more about the puzzle ideas and less the mechanics of the game. So I think that fits really well. So again, I just realized that I totally forgot to just say the premise at the beginning. <laughs> I will try to remember this for the next scenario. <laughs> but basically, the Cory Chaos uh, asks for the group to go get the Yokeless Egg. On top of that, you can have individual members of the court ask the group to betray the rest of the court and help them instead. And they promise that, you know, they'll protect them and just get it and they'll get them out of the court of chaos. And then, you know, that causes whatever else. There's also an agent of law that comes in that you could also help out. So there's a lot of different avenues that you can do. And you can also just add in your own. You can add in a bunch of different groups. You can add in a faction that doesn't have anything to do with law, neutrality, or chaos. You can just have a very powerful celestial or demon or somebody else there that you want to add instead. The party ended up giving the Yokeless Egg to the agent of law, Lexalia, um, and she got them out of there, gave them a bunch of stuff, and that sort of led to a little bit more things with uh, the Core Chaos. But the reason why I wanted to bring up earlier why I think you should use the Core Chaos a lot more is specifically because of how much I didn't really use the sort of pantheon we grew of different entities across the, uh, the campaign. I tried using them here and there, but I was really trying to make sure we stuck with that formula of these are self-encompassed. We still have sort of like in-jokes from past games. We're still a group of friends playing together. And there are things in the past that will come up. But I didn't want them overtaking the scenario, you know? So what I would say as advice is don't do what I did unless you want to, I guess, try and go for the same sort of pulpy, snappy sort of, we just go from scenario to scenario. We don't worry about the in-between. Unless you're doing that, I really think they're a fantastic group for conflict and drama and a lot more fun stuff. So absolutely recommend Intrigue of the Core of Chaos. I will say it is a bit more of a challenging uh, first level scenario than a few other ones. Like People of the Pit is much simpler. It's we got people, we got a pit, get them down there and kill them, you know, that's it. It's it's good, it's a really good one, but you you get what's on the cover, you get what's on the tin. Um, this one has a little bit more to it and I think has a lot of room for expansion across that world if you want to make chaos a bigger part of your game. And so with that, I think we can move on to the next one. All right, so next we have the level two adventure, Moon Slaves of the Cannibal Kingdom. And this is one of all the ones here I would probably like to run again because I feel like this one was the one that suffered the most from the medium of the actual play that I had set. This is a hex crawl. It's a very light hex crawl. It doesn't have like a crap load of stuff. It's not like an endless sandbox, though it can be. Like you can absolutely take this this one module and have a whole campaign out of it. The island can be as dense as you want, and there can be a load of stuff there. And there's already a lot of RP that can be had between the sisters. You can even change it between them wanting to kill each other and all that sort of stuff. You can make it a little bit more of a Cold War kind of thing, where you're kind of stuck in the middle of a much bigger conflict that isn't just a, as easy as go in there and kill them. I could have done that a little bit more with that, but overall I had fun with it. Also, this is where, as you can see on the cover, this is where we had Gormaz show up, which kind of became a bit of a favorite of a lot of us. <laughs> a lot of us enjoyed Gormaz quite a bit, including myself. He was very fun to play. And though he never showed up again after this campaign, or after this scenario, rather, he still showed up in the background in terms of the cities he was conquering and naming after himself. Um, we'll get to him in a bit. Overall, I recommend it. It, it was very fun. It's, uh, again, I, I'm going to have something broken record. I picked out ones that seemed really creative and different and ones that I've had for a long time that I've been meaning to run but never got around to. This Moonslave, um, Intrigue Core Chaos, and Jewels of the Carnifex, which we're, which we're doing next. Oh, and as well as Amir Call as well. They were all a part of basically my first real DCC order. Like when I got in, uh, when I got into DCC and I went, fuck it, I don't care that the shipping from Goodman Games is $1,700. I'm just going to grab a bunch of stuff. And people can say it's a pandemic, but Goodman Games, fix your shipping issue because you are getting ripped off by somebody 
because even before the pandemic, your shipping is insane. <laughs> and I live in Canada. I'm not. I'm not. It's like, I'm not like halfway across the world, and yet I still have like a three hundred dollar order if I want to do that is about $700 for me. <laughs> and I think that's before it even converts to USD. And if you know anything about the Canadian dollar, that's real rough. I'm joking aside about Goodman Games and their terrible shipping. This was a part of that first order. And so it's been on that list of like, part of the reason why I want to get through this backlog was I I've been accruing so many and never actually getting around to some of the ones I had bought originally. So I'm glad I got through some of them. I still have a shitload to do. But yeah, I don't know how you guys know this, but the original plan was to go to level six. Uh, but we never got around to it. So I still have a huge backlog to do. So there might be a season two of Palace Shame campaign. It depends on how much people want that or if they like to see other stuff from us. Crypt of the Devil Lich is probably going to be a thing that comes before that. Which I don't know if I'm going to put that under the Palace Shame banner or if that's just going to be its own thing. Because I think that's going to be its own sort of mini campaign by itself. It's looking pretty chunky. I was looking at the PDF. That shit looks real intense. But that will be a discussion for another time. Let's get back to what we're talking about right now. I think this is one that you want to let breathe because firstly you have a few different premises that you can have for this. You can have a actual goal of like trying to find out what's going on with this island or finding a person or anything like that. It could just be you charting the island uh, as a group and that sort of thing. So whatever, whatever reason why you're here can change how you're going to do the campaign a lot. For us, it was they arrived at the island. They dealt with the sister because I believe one of the chaos lords was like, "Oh, if you want to make it, make your amends to us without us fucking with you all the time, we need you to go help out this lady do this thing." So they did that. But if you're charting it, then like you don't really have an, a set goal that you need to go to, you know. So that could be a much longer game. And I feel like there's a lot of stuff you could do with this. I, I feel like the the moon phases, which change what goes on and what powers are happening. You have several different factions because you have three sisters, and we I, I actually kicked out one sister because even though i mentioned her for what we were doing again because i'm doing sort of an expedited kind of story she would just kind of i guess drag down the pacing a little bit she was interesting uh there's a lot of fun stuff about her and her villa and her whole and her whole little posse of people but it just didn't fit for what i was what i was working with gormaz was really fun i enjoyed role playing as him he is a big gorilla on the cover, but canonically, <laughs> because I thought it would be more horrifying, which is the thing I do a lot with stuff, I decided to make him a giant chimp instead, which is way scarier. So I thought that'd be that'd be fun. With the with the two sisters, Eloise was also fun to roleplay. I enjoy her. You'll notice in the actual play and any other games that I run, I kind of enjoy playing weirdos and just like fucked up beings. They're the most fun for me to play. I don't know why. I don't know if this is about me. I don't know. I don't know if that's cause for concern, but she was just fun to play, you know, when they're going down at the at the fire and she has her little cannibal people, the little little golden golden tribe guys. They're just cooking their own species and she's just ripping it off, like just eating it like a, like a kebab and just talking to them like it's nothing. And that was always fun to do. The other sister, the one that they were tasked with killing, again, I keep forgetting to do the damn premise. <laughs> I, 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 every time, I, I keep forgetting to open up with that. I am so bad for this. So basically the premise I had for them was the Chaos Lord told them to make amends for uh, giving the Euclid's egg to the agent of law. So they were tasked with helping in the laws. She told them, um, I hate my sister. Uh, I want her dead. And they're like, cool. Say no more. And they went off and they went and dealt with her. So I didn't really have much with the other sister. She basically has an entire um, sort of like a James Bond level uh, layer where she's living in this big ass volcano that she's keeping cool to the big machine. And she has like all these like weird metal geometric uh, guys that are just like using the sun's beams to power this machine, this coolant. So they had a fun time seeing her layer. But I didn't actually have much time with her, which I feel like you could do a much better job. And, and it does detail in the, in the module a little bit more how you can kind of role play the different sisters a lot more. Because similar to uh, the Core Chaos, this is one that I feel like if you let people talk, find out what sides they're on. Instead of pushing them in a way like I did, because I, like I said, had a story to sort of get through. If you sort of let the players kind of decide for themselves what they want to do, if the players decide, fuck helping the core of chaos, we're going to do our own thing, I would have obviously allowed that, and that would have been totally fine. I'm always happy to see players just do the complete opposite of what they're expected to do. I think it leads to the most fun stuff. But they didn't do that. They decided to just go along with what they thought was the best option to get the core of chaos off their back. I wasn't able to make the lawful sister much of a personality, which is fine because it led to one of the best scenes in the actual play. It might be my favorite scene, which is basically, this is spoilers for the finale of that one but basically 
Uh, they crept through her lair, killed a bunch of their people, uh, and then found the room she was in. So I just had her sort of like in the final room, kind of just sitting, lounging around. Not because she's not expecting anybody to come, come here. And so they opened a crack in the door and they were watching her. And they're all going back and forth about what they should do. And they decided to go with the sleep spell. But the thing was, they kept like nattering over how much spell run they should do or if it's a good idea or how many they're going to try and get. And it was a very fun reveal <laughs> that she's immune to sleep. But what also happened at the same time that I was saying, did you really think that was going to work? That the that the villain says, one of my Twitch viewers decide to donate 500 bits for a random spell. And I rolled on the on the table because it's just it's absolutely just a random spell uh, that gets cast. And I believe I landed on Scorching Ray. So a giant gout of flame just blasted out of, I believe it was Pip, it's straight at her doing a absolute shitload of damage killing her instantly and then it was just a matter of them just slicing and dicing her little people down to shreds and that sort of became almost like a theme for that game where they would just a thing would happen and then they would just do a giant fucking spell burn and just level everything martin did that a few times with chris but i really enjoyed that moment because it was one of those things where i was like oh you guys are so fucked i was just laughing internally because they're gonna try and cast sleep on this like ancient elf lady and then she gets all cocky and at the same time just gets absolutely burnt to a crisp on the wall and it was just a great time so outside of that a lot of the uh campaign itself was mostly just a little rp and then it was just going through the land there was a another great moment where um <laughs> basically every hireling died uh in one roll they basically killed a bunch of arachnid men and like just fucking dominated them with some great rolls of kicking rocks down a mountain. And then when they were trying to get across that mountain to their side, basically every hireling failed and just crushed to their death. And that was uh, the end of basically most of their hirelings. Outside of that, it was it was just a few combats here and there with wildlife. Overall, I think you can do a lot more with it than I did. Like I said, I feel like I've said that a billion times now. But what I would do if you have any questions on, on what you think you could do with it is that I would just find other modules that you'd like to run inside of it. Because you can, a lot of this is really just almost like a backdrop of like a, like a mini setting. There is sort of the story going on that you can use, but you can also just use it as a guide for like locations and factions and not even worry about the actual like dungeon crawl aspect of itself. You could like, for example, take Jungle Tomb of the Mummy Bride and just throw that in there. Or take any temple or dungeon crawl and just throw it in there as an old temple. Or there's maybe a settlement that's growing or budding that you want to add to it because again, there's a big island here with a bunch of hexes, and you can just add to it what you want and just go from there and actually have like a little island adventure. I would say even though it's already fully realized and giant hot springs island would be a really good resource for that. Uh, if you, in case you want to grab anything from there, any sort of factions or locations that you just like to take and just put into here that would work as well i will say if any of you guys do run this please tell me how it went this was one that i've been wanting to run for a very very long time finally I actually get to experience it because it was really really fun to do so i'd love to hear what other people did with it because i feel like a lot of people who probably run it have probably run it on a bigger timeline than i did but yeah that is moon slaves of the cannibal kingdom uh let's move on to the next one all right so next we have jewels of the carnifex and holy shit if you've watched it you know, this is a fucking mean module. It is real mean. To help show you what I mean by that, you know how all the hirelings died in Moonslays of the Camel Kingdom? They all died again in like the second room. This was a fun one to run. Aha, I'm gonna do the premise first. So the premise for this one is the guys uh, just get the location of a weird under temple. Um, they find out about it. Um, I believe the city I made for it was Third Gormaz, which began that sort of joke of just Gormaz naming every uh, city he conquers after himself. And I'm going to say right now, because I just realized going through all this, I do apologize if some of this just comes off like fully disconnected from anything else I'm saying. This is partial actual play postmortem partial review of these uh, scenarios that I've, that I've done. We are now also getting into modules i'm actually remembering a lot more the first three were a while ago so these ones i'm remembering a little bit more about them since they weren't you know they're still fresh in my memory i really enjoyed this one this one truly felt like i feel like if if somebody's like what is the most dcc scenario that you've run i would say it's probably this one in the premise of this is that you're just going down into this temple that was the carnifex's temple which is sort of um 
an entity that's neither chaos nor law nor neutrality. It's kind of like she's kind of outside of that. So Azazel, Azazel, Azazel. I don't know how you say it. We'll say Azazel because that's just funny to say. So Azazel is the guy who's sort of leading the Paladins of Law down here, and he's not as noble or as great as he'd like you to think he is. He in fact was supposed to sacrifice himself as well to properly seal the Carnifex, but he chickened out and killed the other two guys that were with him but not himself and that's why they're kind of stuck down there just guarding it they can't really die either uh just due to like the weird growths going on there's a lot of weird shit in this but the reason why i'm saying that i think it's probably the most dcc kind of dungeon is that it's really fucking hard you're you're going underground in under temple it's literally an actual dungeon you know um you have the force of law you have a weird entity that's trapped away i very much feel like this has classic sort of tropes run all over it but still really fun and doing its own thing oh another thing too that does which another dcc trope that you'll notice a lot it's in sailors i believe it's in the croaking fane though i have not run or read that one but the name i think gives it away there is a squat demon toad at a certain point in this dungeon which is just as dcc as it gets i believe that is a reference to a clark ash and smith uh short story if you see a squat demon toad in any dcc snare that you're running just know that that's sort of a thing that happens in a lot of them. I'd actually be interested to know how many squat demon toads appear in mainline DCC scenarios. Like, I wonder how many there are that you could point out to. If anybody knows the answer to how many squat demon toads have been published in mainline DCC scenarios, I'd be really interested to find out. So let me know. But as for uh, the module itself, there's a lot of little traps here. There, this, this is not necessarily... I'm going to contradict myself here a little bit. Um, I said this is the most DCC dungeon. I don't know if I would ever recommend anybody run this as their first DCC game. It is, like I said, extremely mean. It has a lot more fuck you traps or la gotcha, you know, sort of traps in this that I'm not the biggest fan of in a lot of games. I do like them in funnels because I feel like funnels are very much the essence of just beer and pretzels gaming. I feel like if you're running this as a one shot, it's perfect for that. Like if you're at a convention, just fucking killing off people, it's great for that. But I think if you want this as part of a campaign, which I'm kind of trying to weave into this video as much as I can, because I know a lot of people are trying to find out what are some good modules to sort of bring into their campaigns. I don't know if this is the ticket. There's a lot of fun stuff, but if you if your players don't like just potentially being killed off purely because the module is kind of mean they might not enjoy this one so this is my hot take for the video this is probably going to be the most controversial thing i say and that is i don't like door puzzles i mentioned it in my portal under the stars review that i didn't like that one there that one's an actual bad one that i stand by and even though it's easy that just i think it sucks but this one is not as bad because it's simpler i just find them boring so basically what this one is you got runes um and it's sealed with a bunch of sort of like lead blocks put into it the puzzle is take out one of the lead blocks you break the seal the door can be opened uh it says the door cannot be opened by magic but i just find in general that door puzzles aren't that interesting because all you really have is just like okay so either we fail and we're still just stuck here and we're just staring at this door trying to figure out what to do next and the most you get out of it the most satisfaction is you get a door open and i just think that's kind of boring i don't think i don't think there's much to it and that's why i'm saying this is a hot take because i could see a lot of different people going like no but like you're opening like the first way into the temple or this or that or any of that sort of thing i can see if it's foreshadowed like part of a campaign you have a whole scene a court with a king and all sort of stuff they mention all these things all these clues so when you get to that first door there's already been this preamble that's that the players have been stewing with and so they get through it pretty easily and there's satisfaction there because they listen to what was said and they use that information to get to that first door this is more just a puzzle and then once they're like oh we do it and we'll get the door open there we go now we're to the temple not the most interesting thing and also in the book it says magic can't open this door and i don't know maybe i'm a dick but i don't like the book telling me what can and can't be done um especially when it comes to solutions because when i usually have a puzzle or an encounter or anything like that i don't make it with necessarily a solution in mind i might have one that just comes to my head when i'm making it if i work backwards but in general i'm just putting it there to see what the players do with it i'm usually just looking for a really creative answer and potentially a really good role if the answer is really really good i'm gonna make you do a role or give you like a role with a good bonus and if the answer is really bad i might make it a really hard role or a medium role depending on how you know how it is but when it comes to just a door 
when somebody asks, can I can I reverse my men spell to be a tear? I'm like, that's creative, and I like it. That's my hot take. Door puzzles suck. Don't do them unless you have something really, really good to make it satisfying. Otherwise, the end success is I get a door opened. Like, treasure is fine. Like, treasure is treasure. Like, you got you got a whole fucking box. You got a, a room, whatever it might be, full of stuff that the players want. It's great there. Just getting a door open. Not a fan. Um, and I also think, don't listen to the book. The book tells you, no, that it can't be done this way. Say, fuck you, book. I'm a person, and I'll do whatever the fuck I want. And then uh, you do it, and uh, then you have a good time. Oh boy. Basically, the only right answer is to join the Carnifex because she'll just get you out of there. I did run differently because I think we were running a little bit over long. I sort of had her just sort of whisk them away and then, you know, they were left with a pendant of, of her symbol. Like the other ones, I recommend Jewels of the Carnifex. I will say, do not do this for a first time unless you really want to punish your players, which can be fun in its own way. I would just make sure that everybody knows, like, hey, by the way, you're probably going to die, so don't take your characters too seriously. But I think this is a great one for a campaign. And for level three, but by the time your group gets to level three, they already know what to expect with a lot of stuff. So it's a great time to start actually killing players. I wouldn't say I go easy on anybody, but I will say that I do think I make people roll less than what other people do. Uh, when, when players give me a good idea, I tend to really hate... Oh, you give me a good idea? Okay, now roll for it. So you gave me this whole speech about why these guys should follow you and listen to you and do all these things, and, and you put so much work and thought into this. All right, roll me d d20. Oh, you rolled a one. They go like, oh, they just don't listen to you, and they walk away. But that's the worst. That's the worst when a player puts a lot of work into something and then doesn't get any sort of reward for it at all. Like Even a bonus would help, but even then it can, it can suck. So a lot of times what you'll notice is that when players give me a good idea, I kind of just go, ah, fuck it. You don't need to roll for that. You just you just do it. Here's what happens. And a lot of that is, I guess, all in a way, a reward for the players for actually engaging, paying attention, actually listening to details and stuff. It's something as a GM that I really appreciate because one of the hardest things for me when, I'm, when doing online gaming and one of the reasons why I have those four guys specifically because they're really good players is that I hate asking or looking at a group going like, oh, what are you going to do next? Or how does this happen? And I just get the this bank of blank faces staring back at me and going like, um, what's happening again? That's the worst thing to hear. So that's why that's why I'll say a lot of my character, a lot of my players probably survive a lot more than most DCC characters do. It's that I probably do a lot less roles than you're probably doing, which is not a bad or good thing. I'm more just trying to explain where it's like this is a good place to start really killing off characters if you want. And if you already have characters dying off left and right, then they're probably not going to notice the difference going into this one. But yeah, let's move on to the next one. This one's great. If you're looking for a sort of classic wizard tower adventure, that's a classic one. You, you find an evil wizard, go through their tower, and just deal all their weird shit. This is awesome. You aren't dealing with just stone rooms with fucking random goblins and orcs and, you know, random slaves or whatever. You got lots of crazy shit. And the guys didn't see most of the stuff that's in here. I think I'm definitely going to do a video on this one because I've... I will say this. This is... I'll, I'll, I'll admit something here. I'll admit the, a dark secret. I've already run this one. This one didn't need to be in the Palace Shame. But I also don't have any other level 4 adventures. So I just wanted to run this one again instead of buying another one and adding to the collection. Kind of defeating the purpose. So you have to forgive me for that. But this one is great. There's so much stuff that the guys didn't see. There's a really horrifying room I'll get into in a second. Absolutely recommend. If you are looking for that sort of thing, you are going to get here. This one has a pretty good setup if you have an urban campaign going. The other ones, I mean, actually, Jewels of the Carnifex also takes place um, under a city. So that one also works. These two could actually work out well, sort of back-to-back -back kind of adventures like we did in the city. If you have a few months maybe between them or if things are just going that crazy in whatever city they're in, uh, it could work for that as well. So with that one, basically how it goes, here's the premise. It's a little bit more complicated than the other ones. You got two wizards. A lady and, and a guy. They used to love each other, and they probably still kind of do. It's a little messy. You know, it, it's complicated. One went to chaos, the other one went to law. Usual shit. But basically, they just saw things differently. And basically, for the last, I think, centuries, they've been fighting on different planets through proxies and all different kinds of things. And this is just the next scheme in a long line of them. You got Leota, the woman, I believe she's a, a, a sort of more lawful kind of wizard, and a miracle who went full chaos, you know. So basically, the opening to the scenario is on the front cover here you got you got leota 
Santa uh, posing as a miracle, and you have those sort of winged monkeys, or winged apes, rather. Little little winged gormazes flying around. And so basically, after Leota frames him, the group is tasked with dealing with him in his tower. So the, the wizard tower itself is really fun, but as the group goes towards it, you can see it changing. So already, you have it set for the, for the group to see, oh, we're dealing with... Like, an actual real wizard tower here. There's not just stone going up. There's a lot, of, a lot of crazy changes. Basically, every quarter hour, I believe, the, uh, the tower morphs and changes. So, like, some of the examples of the changes of the tower. Uh, you can have, like, a smoky, jagged crystal with a crown-like top. Smooth, purple-white marble with a crenellated platform at its apex. Rusted iron adorned with sharp, spear-like spires. That sounds actually very, uh, planescape-y. Sounds very much like Sigil. But you see how it changes, and not only that when they change it actually makes that hard to climb so the dc for the climb is different so i like the mechanics and i like the actual tower itself changing it really just shows okay we're dealing with somebody who's actually powerful here so in the game the guys got there if for anybody who listened to the actual play you know that they met the hardest enemy the group has dealt with which was that fucking padlock on the door to the gate. Not in the tower, to the yard. They finally got it open, and they went through. And so they did not see everything in that tower. And I'm gonna say, I know I've been, I've been pretty nice so far. I haven't really given many criticisms because it's been sort of surface level. This map, this map for this tower is insane. I'm probably gonna be saying this a lot more, and I'm gonna get a lot of hate for this. I'm gonna, you know what? Second hot take of the video. I'm gonna get a lot of hate for this. I don't love... DCC maps. Now, there's about 18 asterisks next to, that, next to that. I love the art. I love how they fill out every space. I love how they just use up everything they can to make it feel like the theme of what you're running. And that's all well and good, but when it's really hard to read where things are supposed to be, that's really annoying. And what I would like personally still have your nice artsy kind of map and then have a classic sort of map just the squares just the just the grids uh just very boring you know the way the way you'd see them in you know um an old school essentials book or something i'll put um i'll put winter's daughter's map up on the screen here so you can see what i mean by basic you know or even more basic than winter's daughter like just literally just squares and rooms just so i can see where things are much more easily and the reason why is just look at this map like that is insane that there's so much stuff there and that's not it doesn't look that bad when i show it to you but when you notice that there's actually like a bunch of different lines and arrows going to different places it became a little little rough i will say it's nothing compared to the next one and we'll get to that but it was a little annoying here and there i'm like wait where is this supposed to lead to but yeah so that's my only complaint with the module but there are some cool ass rooms they, there are some fun rooms that they did see they first they i can't believe they decided to go for the pterodactyl room basically the way it works is there's two ways into the tower you have the main entrance which has a trap on it they decided once they saw that was going on that they um didn't want to fuck with that and so they climbed the tower to the pterodactyl room i believe it was martin's uh, thief who just <laughs> ran up behind it and just cracked it on the back of the head and immediately killed the pterodactyl after it was trying to terrorize one of Dan's characters. Um, it was hilarious and just constantly happened through the campaign. They would just get a really good roll or a crit or something and just obliterate an encounter. And I cannot tell you how much I absolutely love that. It's the best shit. Like... If you're playing DCC and you get mad that your encounter got destroyed by a wizard or a thief or a warrior or anything, find a different game. Like, I, I, don't, I don't say that lightly. I think it's really rude to tell someone, like, oh, go, go find something else. Go play something else. But I mean it seriously. Like, this game is so unbalanced and out of control that if you get mad as a GM that they ruined your encounter, ruined in big quotation marks, then I just don't think it's for you. Because it's going to happen all the time, and it's really fun every time it happens, as we'll see here in a little bit um, In this, <laughs> at the end of this uh, scenario. They saw a nice pterodactyl, which they murdered. Uh, they saw some basilisks in a big sort of stony room. They dealt with a few other things here and there. There was one room 
I was really hoping they would see because it's fucking terrifying in like in an existential way. But I believe you can only basically reach that if you went through the normal way in, not the pterodactyl way in. Which I think is a fun way to have a little bit of replayability as a GM to sort of see things differently. The first group I ran for went through the front door. The room that I'm talking about is a room called Gollum Storage. And basically it's a room with six golems on slabs just around this fire. And the fire lets out a noxious gas. But basically what happens if anybody touches any of these six golems, their soul gets sucked into the golem. Now, there's ways out of it with spells and a few other things, and they're now inside the golem's body. Which, like I said, if this is like fucking COC. That's a sanity check right there. That's, that's horrifying. And even more horrifying is that some of these don't have legs. And I think one doesn't have legs or arms. So you can get... Depending on which one they touch, because they they could touch like a metal one, and then they're metal. They could touch like a wooden one, and they have like double damage from fire. There's a few of these where they just take their stat block. There's actually a handout in the back where you can see all of them and gives their stats and everything. So depending on which one they pick, you can see there's one there with like no legs and no arms. So you get stuck in that. You're gonna get one of those warriors to sort of get a nice big sling and sort of have you on his back or something, because you're not moving out of there. So I love that, and I had wished we had come across that room, but we had a lot of other stuff we went across. They finally get to where Amir Call is, and he's expecting them. Basically, the way it's supposed to happen is you finally find Amir Call. He's expecting you. You have a big sort of battle, and then Leota comes in. Then you have sort of this sort of fight going on between the two of them. And you sort of either choose a side or just go against both of them or uh, run off to grab the glass darkly, which was an object you're supposed to go find and either destroy or take or whatever. It's just sort of the MacGuffin that's sort of powering this whole tower. I think it's an interesting concept. I don't know how well it's executed. What I would do if you're doing a bigger campaign is after the initial attack where you get sort of asked to help deal with the mirror call, what I would do is actually have maybe some time where it's like, we need time to prepare before you guys can go to deal with a mirror call. Do you mind helping us out with a few of the preparations? And I would say having Leota be one of the people they help out a little bit more, get to know her a little bit, a little bit, and then send them off is better. Because when I had it with my first group, Leota meant nothing to them because they totally forgot about her from the beginning. And then she shows up and then I go like, oh, you recognize that Leota is actually like that, that sister of the apprentice. And then, but the players are like, uh, okay, I don't care. We're probably still just going to kill him and then kill her. So if you do want a little bit more where you think the characters or the players will care about, you know, who they should side with. I think you do want to expand and develop her as a character. But if you watch the actual play, you know she never showed up for a very specific reason. And that is Martin with his spellcaster, Chris, spell burned so much on, I believe, I can't remember if it's Flaming Hand or Scorching Ray. I'm going to say it's Scorching Ray. Chris cast Scorching Ray at a 32 plus, which is literally taking the <laughs> the magma from the earth's core and shooting it upwards in a direction and so what i had them do was just that the giant pillar of magma just came up through the tower hit him obviously killing him and also crumbled the tower and the best part too was then he cast feather fall on everybody and he cast just high enough. He didn't have anything else left to really to really burn anymore by this by this point in the game. He cast Featherfall just high enough that when they jumped out, the Featherfall spell effect was able to get everybody and then also would drop them the exact amount they need. I believe it was 200 feet that they need to drop and he did just enough to get 200 feet of safety. So they just basically blew up this tower. It started to crumble and then they skydived out of it slowly and then just got out as the whole tower behind them just got destroyed. But yeah, but I highly recommend Miracle is Framed. Very good sort of wizard tower adventure if you want a wizard tower. Honestly, I would say even if you don't want to run the adventure like as is, I'd say if you want a wizard tower, this is worth picking up just to grab ideas from. There's a lot of different rooms that even if you don't have them all in your wizard tower, they're good just to steal and be like, oh, this would be a great one to have here for guarding treasure, or this would be great as an opener part, or just to load this and that. And so I think we'll move on to our last one. And so we're at the final one against the Atomic Overlord. And I gotta say, of all these, I think this one is the most creative and also the hardest one to run. This is not a beginner scenario. I would not recommend it to anybody who is just starting out. That's not, when I say that, I don't mean like there's a crap load of stuff that's really hard. It's just that like, I would say if, if let's say you got three scenarios that you look, you're looking at running for a campaign, you just want to do like, like through them back to back. I don't think I'd recommend this if this is your first time. Any of those, totally. This one, firstly, if you're trying to show people DCC, this one absolutely fits the bill of being gonzo as hell, but then really is not sword and sorcery. It's like sword and planet, I believe Jack called it. I believe it's closer to that genre. What this is, is a mutant crawl classic scenario 
written for DCC characters is basically what this is, which is really cool. I think the funnest part about this was having to try and relate real world stuff that the players knew that their characters didn't. You know, one of the things that was fun was calling the monorail a demon carriage. Itai the Oracle, who was a computer, calling himself like a, a trapped spirit in a box. And basically, before I get ahead of myself again, because I'm already catching it, the plot of this one is the players get sent to a planet called Mezarkul. Mezarkul is a destroyed planet that died in nuclear war many, many years ago. And they arrive at what's called the Dead City. And there's a guy called the Overlord, who you never actually really meet. And he has a big sort of giant tank fortress that I'll show here because it looks fucking badass. I love this artwork. That whole structure is not a part of this scenario. This is a really... I don't know if it really shows just because of like how thin this looks. But this is a really chunky scenario. It's got a lot in it. Um, but it does not cover that. It sort of says if you want to do that, that's its own thing, which I think would be really cool. But basically what this is, is more of a faction game as well as a hex crawl, which if you saw the actual play, isn't really how I ran it. I actually probably changed this one the most from the other ones. Like all of the, all of the other ones, I feel like I ran pretty much how they're supposed to be run. I changed the thing here or there for, you know, ease and just because of the medium I was doing it in. This one I changed a lot because I'm going to be, I'm going to be critical of this one. I think this needs a second printing. I think this needs to go back to the editor and fix some stuff up. One of those things being what I said earlier, the map. Firstly, this has like five pages of maps, which work. Let me just show you real quick. Actually, you know what? It's gonna be easier if I just put it on the screen. So let me just show you right here the five different maps this has. I think it's five. So you got five maps and they are showing different things and it is good to have all the information, but it is in that DCC style when you're doing this much, it gets really confusing. But that's not the only reason why I think it needs a second printing. There's a lot of stuff here that I'm still not totally sure how it's supposed to work because it's broken down into five different sections that also kind of weave into each other so for example the great egg i'm gonna be honest with you and i feel like if anybody has this at home please read this and please comment if you know exactly the great egg to me was the warhead in the nuke but the thing is is that at a certain point i mentioned in the actual play there's these uh, floating hoverboards near the gold station. There's these hoverboards, sort of like uh, hovering platforms that you can sort of use to push them across. Apparently, that was a thing that they really needed to move the Great Egg. But then also, they need to go to a different carriage station to press a button to set it off. And I know I'm being very confusing if you haven't watched the actual play, but I'll explain what I mean in a second. But basically, the story is, is that they get sent to this planet. They get into a big fight with the Overlord's minions, who are all these guys who are being controlled by like these, like, imagine like facehuggers from Alien, but like on the back of their head, sort of controlling their brain and that sort of stuff. And they're, they attack the party when they show up. And then there's a, a computer, an AI called Itai the Oracle, that sends her troops to go help them out because they're sort of part of a, this big battle going on. The, the PCs got dropped into the into this giant fight and so she sort of helps them out and then sort of brings them over to where uh, she is and explains that they basically need to go set off this nuke and they don't say it like that obviously but that's as time goes on the, the players will sort of recognize what is because the missile silo she calls like a wizard tower she calls the overlord uh, a necromancer because that'd be terms that they would understand and just says sort of things like that, that that she thinks they will understand better than you know saying like missile silo and like control room and these things what ended up happening was the great egg seems to be the missile warhead itself but then the book it says the players are going to need one of those moving platforms i mentioned earlier but it also mentions that they need to press the red button in a control room to set off the great egg and this control room is at the end of a monorail line like further away from the missile silo so when I was reading through this, I was like, is the great egg the red button? Because I'll show you a picture up right now. And it says triggers the great egg and it shows the red button at the bottom of what looks like a small egg. But that to me was just like the control room on a different section. Like, you know, if you were to set off a rocket, like you're not right next to the rocket going off. You're in another area and then you, you know, you'd set off that way. Like, so you're not being burned alive horribly would be my guess. <laughs> so I didn't really know what it meant by needing those hover platforms to move the great egg. I don't know if they were meant to move the move the warhead closer to the control room and just set it off that way so i just decided to say fuck all the details because it already got a little bit confusing at certain points i was trying to explain stuff it's probably confusing right now to some people who are like what the hell are you talking about but basically what i had them do was just like yeah just go to the control room on that end 
and then set off the ritual, as she called it, basically just the protocols to set off the missile. Set off the ritual and try and use your magic, because there's no magic on this earth, to get the good outcome. Because what the players don't know is that it's not actually a nuke. It's like, it is a nuke, but it's also kind of like a chaos nuke. If the nuke goes off, it would like wrap it in like undeath. But with the magic from this other world that they don't have on Mazar Kul, basically uh, Chris could use her magic to give it the opposite effect, the Eden effect as they call it, which gives it like the lawful life effect, which they which they got and you know sort of made everything beautiful and brought all the vegetation back and destroyed all electronics across. Basically, a big EMP. So I know I'm rambling a lot here, but that's what I'm that's what I'm saying. Like if you're confused, like. Imagine how I felt reading through it. So if you have this at home and you want to read through it and you can tell me exactly how it's supposed to go, I'd love to hear it because I was going back and forth and I was like, man, this feels like it's not that complicated, but the way it's laid out and the way it's written and the way it's put in different areas is making this feel a lot more complicated than it needs to be. So I would like to see this actually get like, I don't know, maybe a second printing. Maybe it already has one. Maybe other people complain about this because I did feel like I was lost here and there. And so basically to go further uh, with this one, how you can run this, what's great, because especially with the map, sort of like Moon says the Campbell Kingdom, there is a hex map with a bunch of stuff. You have basically right here a whole setting this dead city could have so much stuff there's there's actually four factions in this in this book i i omitted one because of how i was doing things it just didn't really matter and also that faction seemed a little redundant if i'm being fully honest i wasn't a really i didn't really see the reason why they were there she's basically just a person who also hates the overlord but doesn't want the players to set off the great egg in the good way because she's a cyborg and so she would die if it goes off and because it's a big emp so it sounds interesting, but when you're just trying to do a quick, like, one-shot, which turned into a two-shot, it bogs things down. With this, you can have a whole setting just here. Like, I could actually see you doing a bit of, um, if you want to, you know, break things up. If you're if you're doing a usual sword and sorcery DCC setting, and you want to break things up, send them to this world. Maybe have them spend uh, some time here dealing with the Overlord, dealing with other factions you make up. You could have a, a whole dead city having a bunch of things. You could basically turn this into... A bit of a post-apocalypse game for a while. I mean, we kind of did that with these guys. You know, they were slinging swords and plasma guns, which is another thing I changed. They're supposed to be sort of like more like um, electricity guns, but I was just kind of like, eh, I kind of like plasma. I mean, I'm a big, I'm a big Fallout fan, and I've always liked uh, how plasma turns people into goo. So I was like, yeah, let's do let's do goo guns. So you have sort of a, basically um, a hex crawl above ground, and then there's also a dungeon crawl below ground with all sorts of crazy stuff. So this, this one has a load of content, absolutely thick with it. Um, you have a lot of cool, interesting monsters. Like, this is actually great, too, if you're also running, like, MCC, if you're running Moon Crawl Classics instead. This is a great one to use as well. They can be just transported to a different part of the planet, if you want, that way. And there's lots of weird, creepy monsters in this they add. There's a whole bestiary in the back. We didn't even, I don't even think we saw all the monsters that are in this, in this just in this book. I, I will add, on top of this whole ramble that was the review for this one, I really love the clever joke of the handout showing the uh, radioactive symbol and Itai the Oracle calling it magical corruption. I thought that was very funny and I'm the player seemed to like it. Outside of, I think, the layout not being great, the maps being, again, hard to read in a lot of them and being a little bit confusing as to where things led. Outside of that, I think this was really fun. This felt like a real nice shakeup and a great place to end it where they saved a whole planet and then went off and walked off in their own sort of their own walks of life i thought was a great way to end it like all these there's not a single one i didn't like here i recommend this one as well honestly it'd be really fun to see if anybody wanted to do it uh if anybody did this exact campaign for their own group and no, i don't mean like in the same way as in like one to the next to the next if you took all six scenarios here and then just saw how your players did it instead of mine and saw how you could weave them into a bigger story that'd be really cool to hear how that goes but yeah that's against the atomic overlord really good one uh really creative Highly recommend if you are looking for a real change up to your campaign where you feel like, ah, oh, man, we're getting lots of wizard towers and weirdness, and I just want a little bit of a, a little bit of a change. This is the way to go. That was all six uh, scenarios we did for the actual play. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I had fun actually doing it. So if you'd like to see more like this, I would love to do them. They're also, <laughs> I'm not going to lie, easier to edit. And don't worry, this is me just sort of trying out this different format. I'm just sort of looking at the camera. But other format, I do really enjoy doing. I think it's a lot of fun just actually having all the content on there real quick. And the burger emojis are adorable. So that's why I do if I don't feel like being on camera. So if you do like this style or that style, please let me know. So also, if there are any like DCC scenarios like me to do, I'll probably do them as well. However, um, for the next little bit, I might be straying away from DCC. Between the actual play and just playing it a lot in the last two years, 
I'm not burned out of it, and I usually jump back into it pretty quickly, but I think I like to diversify into like maybe Worlds Without Number or uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord or a few other things that I have my eye on that I've, I've been enjoying playing or looking at. So there's a few other things I'll probably be popping up on the channel that are not DCC related. Sorry if that uh, upsets you. <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. This was really fun. The campaign was great. The players were awesome. I said before, but thank you so much to everybody who came out or has supported the show. It's been really, really great seeing all the feedback we've gotten it's been pretty much a hundred percent positive and yeah you guys are awesome so uh i'll see you around play smart play risky and stay safe out there mm -hmm.